that first little thing that came, they came out with, you know, it didn't do much, but it <laughs> got them on the radio in Los Angeles. And then uh, they, he, they called themselves Caesar and Cleo then. They didn't, he didn't do the Sonny Jesus because that's when that, 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 you remember there was a movie out by, uh, with, with, with Richard Burton and, uh, what's her name? Elizabeth Taylor. Elizabeth Taylor, yeah. Called Cleopatra. Yes. And uh, so they was sort of mimicking that, you know, and they called themselves Season Cleo. I see. That was that first record. Yeah. It, it, it came out at Season Cleo. And uh, then, you know, got a little, got a little recognition, but with Sonny's promotional appearance, uh, abilities, and his ability to woo people into, just like he got to be a senator, you know, he could do that. Mm. And so he got another another thing, and the next time they called himself Son and Cher. And, and so what was it like working with them? Uh, well, the it, 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 I never thought of my, through, it was different, you know. I mean, I knew Sonny, and I, I, I trusted him because he knew all the stuff inside the business and stuff like that. And uh, what I never considered myself working. Uh, I mean, it was just like helping him to do what he wanted to do. So I never thought my, of myself as working, uh, all, although maybe I should have, I would have made some money if I, if I would have really you know, saw him in that light. I just saw him as a truck driver who could write songs. And, and he was hustling, you know. Uh, so it was all right. It was all right. I, I always thought of Cher as just a little groupy girl, girl who, you know, who wanted to do it. I, I didn't ever, did, uh, you know, uh, we never became a, a friends, a social thing like that. I mean, I didn't, I wasn't into that. Uh, I could have been. They wanted me to be in it. And they were all try to get me to be in it, but. That didn't agree. First of all, it didn't agree with my family life. You know, I mean, I was married, and by the time this time I had three or four children, and they certainly were not. You know, they were not. They didn't want to be in that life. So that's that's what happened with most of that. Okay, and uh, so I just want to talk a little bit about the New Orleans thing because mm -hmm. um, just even now it seems like a lot of musicians. <clears throat> they'll leave New Orleans, mm -hmm. and some of them will just, that's it, they leave New Orleans. But yeah. then um, it always seems like the, that you had the New Orleans sound with you, and that, that was always yeah. an important part of, uh, mm -hmm. of, of your of what career. I did. Would you say that that's true? And if so, yeah, why? it's very true. Why? Because I, wherever I went, I saw the influence, or uh, 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 saw what people liked about you know, it was all the way from back when I had my little Army Reserve thing. And I would say, well, yeah, I'm from New Orleans. Say, oh, you're from New Orleans? People would respond to it like that. And I found out everywhere I went that people recognized New Orleans for much more than I thought it was. They recognized the city. Why? Because, they, because of the music. That's what was always the lead force, uh, you know, from the city. And I always believed, I really believed that, that um, a lot of, that New Orleans did not understand how important it was. And I think that still seems to be a problem. Uh, well, it's different now, but it always has been a problem that the people of New Orleans did not they were like me. They just didn't, you know. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. Everybody's family had somebody who could play. You, you know, it was, it was so so common until, you know. But I had gone out to California when I left New Orleans. I I, I do know that. Oh yeah. But but I thought that AFO had an office here in New Orleans. Also, was that after California or was that before? No, no, it was no, it was. See, I, 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 just started, I didn't know about the record business until I went to California. Okay. Because yeah, we went to California. I went to California to be a jazz musician. 
not to you know have stuff, but uh, uh, since you know I, we knew no Ornette was the only cat we knew out there, and so fool around with Ornette, we went into a little studio out there and did some demos, and they selected me to go around and take it through different record places to see if we could get a record deal. I don't know why they selected me. Anyway, uh, that's how I got to, to meet, you know, the people, some of the people in the record thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, there was a guy named Bumps Blackwell. Have you ever heard of him? I have heard the name. Yeah. Bumps Blackwell was was a uh, uh, A&R man for Specialty Records. He did all of those Little Richard records and those things back there. You know. Yes. And they did a lot of them in New Orleans here. You That's know, right. They did all those. And so the owner of the company, Aunt Roop, uh, would also come down there once in a while. He loved New Orleans. He loved gospels and raucous New Orleans music. And uh, so Bl Bumps Blackwell, I, when I found out he was there, I said, well, maybe he might know me and I can, we can get to do some jazz there. But I went to there, and he was about to uh, record Sam Cooke as a pop star, you know. Pop. Sam, Sam had been, been a, a gospel singer. He had been a gospel with the uh, Soulsters, I think he was. But Buzz Blackwell said, man, this cat could be a big, big pop star if he would change over to, to pop music. So he, uh, he had set up the session for him to sing summertime, you know, to, and I happened to go by there with my little on that comb and stuff. So Bunk Blackwell said, look, man, I ain't got time for that, but right now, if you can help me get this guy, get this thing together like that, I can check, check it out. And uh, so he sent me in to, with Sam to find a B-side to put on his hit record he was going to produce for Sam. And that's, that's when I, I didn't find it. Sam just had you send me among the tunes that he had written, and he was playing them all for me. And, uh, and so we settled on that tune as a B-side, you know. And that's how that happened. When we, we went to the studio, uh, and they finished with Summertime, they hit so this one, and he had, Bumps asked him, what y'all got for B-side? I said, well, we got this little tune here. Oh, a cover of Summertime was the A-side. Yeah, it right. is. Summertime, well, that's what he was planning on breaking Sam into the pop world with. Uh, so we could, we could put that on the B-side. And after about three or four takes, Art Roop came into the building, went to the studio, and... Uh, he didn't like what we what he heard. <laughs> he didn't like what he heard because he he really liked good gospel music, and he thought of Sam as a gospel shouter, you know. And he we got him in there singing this little quiet stuff like that. He said, "No, man." And he got real mad, and he fired the singer because I had it was those four white girls singing. He certainly didn't like that. He said, "Man, y'all got him sounding like a white boy up here." So he. He fired, fired all of them, and he got mad with bumps, you know, like, well, he didn't know me. <laughs> so I, I sort of, okay. <laughs> but anyway, that, but after, after a while, uh, he lost Sam and he lost bumps. So he hired me to come back to New Orleans and scout some talent for him, and he hired Sonny Bono. Sonny Bono used to come by there with songs because he was a songwriter. But he was a meat truck driver. He used to drive a meat truck. And on his route, he would stop by there to try to peddle his songs, you know. So he hired Sonny and me to take one place. And uh, so I began to see what was happening on the inside of the music business. I came back to New Orleans, and I had an office. I did have an office over by uh, Houston's. I don't know if you remember. No, Houston's on St. Charles Avenue? Oh, no, 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 no. Houston, Mr. Mr. Houston was the president of the uh, the Black Union. It was two two separate unions then. Yes, that's right. And Mr. Houston was the president, 
and he also got a music store right across the street on Claiborne Avenue. Ah, okay. And so I got an office there for specialty records and uh, auditioned people and, and uh, recorded a few of them. Like I recorded Art Neville back then, that was, you know, and I recorded a group called the Monitors and so forth for specialty. But after a while, I said, you know, I, 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 my, my militancy hit me, not my, it didn't hit me, but I was, I, I was, uh, well, you, you got questions, I mean, I'm talking again. Well, we're just trying to lead up to the foundation of the AFO. AFO well, AFO was, a, was, was, was the outcome of that, where I am now, where I, I ran into a, a cat who was a black Muslim. Uh, a cat named Jimmy, Jimmy X, and he got to talking about it, and he started, that put some, oh. who's that? She just turned around and left. Oh, okay. Uh, well, Jimmy, Jimmy, you know, he's talking about, what, you know, what you know, our situation was, and I, I said, now, you know, this cat sounds sort of crazy, but what he's saying makes sense. The essence of what he was saying was that uh, Elijah Muhammad was teaching them that we didn't own anything. That was part of our problem. We didn't own any, any economic thing that was, you know, that was ours. You know, the Chinese have this, and the Italians have that, and the Jews have this. But what y'all got? Jobs as porters and so forth like that. And I start thinking, see, you know, He's right about that. I mean, why don't we all, why we don't all, we create all this music, man. They like our music. So why don't we own it? And that was my, that was the thing that was going in my head. And after I'd seen what happened with our group, you know, up there and so forth, I said, man, we need to, we need to start owning some, some, try to find a way to own our own music. And that's what all for one came how it came about because uh, uh, I just figured a way that uh, I figured out what, what how much we earn uh, as side men and at that time we thought it was a good salary you know we you make forty one forty one dollars for a record date play four rec four songs and so forth like that and that was a nice nice money but <laughs> you don't do it that often. But I figured up, I said, now, nah, here's a cat in Lee Allen. You ever heard of Lee Allen? Yeah, we got Yeah, well, Lee Allen was on all of them Fats Domino records and all that. And I said, now, nah, if this cat only, if this, I figured up, I said, now, nah, he, if he's on, a, on his, so many records, I figured out that he made about $2,500 a year from doing record dates. But I said, now, nah, if he only got Two cents royalty on one of those fast domino records, he'd make ten thousand dollars. So I say, well, if he, if see, if, if we stop, if we we didn't realize by working for hire, I didn't understand that. I didn't, we didn't know none of the economic background that underpinned the record business or any business for that matter, because we weren't raised in families where the people owned things. I mean, it, my grandfather owned his. His, uh, his business, which was what I need. I need, I need somebody who looked at it. I bring it to him, let him look at it, and I tell him what I, what, what's wrong with it. And I might try to play again. I really would like to play uh, again. I, I, last week I heard, I, I was invited to a dinner party, and the doc, it was a doctor who gave it. He had hired David Talkinowski, uh, Herlin Riley, Roland Guerin, uh, Donald Harrison, and Steve Mazakowski to play at the party. And boy, did they play. Oh, man, they played so, so wonderfully, man. It made me want to get up and play. <laughs> so, and that's, that's, in fact, I was telling talking about it. And he said, hey, man, I know somebody can fix that horn up for you. I ain't heard back from him yet, you know. I don't know if you know the talk, talk or not. I do, yes. <laughs> yeah. 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 But I love, they just really enjoyed that playing. 
So that's what, that's what I would like. That's what I would like to do. Since I had the stroke, uh, this hand never come back to where anywhere I could I could do it. My mind would tell me to do. It. But I think I can find a way to play if I get this horn right. And I got a book coming out. It's supposed to come out this fall. I'm sort of an autobiography. That uh, the New Orleans Heritage, what's the people there? What is the New Orleans Collection? Historic New Orleans Collection? Yeah, yeah, they, they say they're going to publish it. Wow, that's great. Yeah, it's a great thing. The name of the book? No, oh, oh, Unfinished Blues is going to be the name of Unfinished Blues. Well, tell us a little bit about the book. Are you writing that yourself, or is it? It's all I've written. Yeah, I've written it. I wrote it. But that was, that was, that was a real learning experience. It occupied almost, actually, when I really added up, it was almost 10 years for me to really do that. And that was hard. So I can't, first of all, I, you know, I'm trying to type and all that stuff like that. I didn't think I was going to have to write it because uh, I don't know if you know there's a guy named Kalamu Yassalam. Well, he had he had a writer's workshop, and I had given them, I you know knew him very well, and I had given them uh, uh, some stuff that I had written before I came down here. Uh, that was personal that was for my family and all that stuff like that. I just gave it to them to edit. But after they went through edit, man, this they come back to me, you know you need to write a book. <laughs> and and I didn't think that I thought I thought they would write it. They would take it so, but I fooled around nearly four years waiting for them. So I said maybe I I said I didn't do it myself. So then, then, then I start finding out about the, the, the hassle you have to go through to get a publisher. Because I didn't know that it was all that. But it, they, the, the collection people had refused at first. Then, about a year later, they came back and offered me another one. They said they, they think they want it. But they, what they really wanted, they wanted some of my stuff. You know, they wanted stuff to put in, a, in their collection over there. And, you know, they wanted all the facts and all that. Well, this is cool. I, think, I need somewhere. I ain't got no room over here for it. <laughs> Y'all got more room than I got. And that's what Armistead also has. You know, I, I went to them years ago to start, you know, giving stuff. And I've been on a crusade trying to get other musicians to, to get Armistead or to get any of the museums to, uh, I mean, I know they got the jazz, Hogan Jazz Archives over there. And, uh, I was trying to get Amistad to, to in the same vein as trying to just get New Orleans to wake up to the treasures that are here. And I know that Amistad has, uh, they, they're putting like judges and political people on the top of, wrong of what, who needs to be remembered. But I'm saying, you're in New Orleans. I'm, I say, man, hey, this is New Orleans, man. You know, <laughs> if you're going to put all of these criminals up, up at, on the top because they put politicians, you're not, you're not showing your best foot. The world does not recognize New Orleans for, for their politicians. <laughs> they recognize this for the music that came out of this place. They, they'll accept Louis Armstrong as an ambassador, even except maybe, no, they ain't gonna accept whatever Mayfield would put them with it. But that's what it's gotten to be. It's gotten to be a political thing, it's, you know. Uh, anyway, don't get me started, all right. Thank you, Mr. Batista, I appreciate it. All right. Great. But, you know, I wanted to talk about the Silver Book a little bit because uh, mm -hmm. it, that okay. seems to be a distillation of your passion for mm -hmm. the particular yeah. type of music 
coming from New Orleans yeah. in the latter half of the 20th century mm -hmm. that, that that's really the music that you're passionate about. So can yeah. you talk well, about the Silver Book and what that means to you and how all that came yeah, together? Silver Book, and that's a bad title, man, you know, but I call it the Silver Book because uh, when I got the idea, uh, it was the 25th anniversary of my publishing company, Adelaide Publishing Company. So it was a silver anniversary, and so I just called it the Silver Book, because that's where all that music came from. And and secondarily, it was it was it was uh, Ellis Marcellus gave me the idea. He didn't realize it, but he we had we had come together, the five of us. Did you, you have you seen it? No, the book. Oh yes, I have. Yeah. You, you had, well, the they have a copy of it over at the. Uh, all right. Yeah. Well, see that picture on the back. That was our. That one right there. We had gone. We had come together right then at, for that event there. There was a promoter in Atlanta who wanted to do a, 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 a concert or something for Blackwell. They wanted to do it, and so he called all around the country. I was still out in LA then, and Ellis was still in Virginia, and brought us all five together. The original American Jazz Quintet as a tribute to. Edward Blackwell, and uh, while we were rehearsing that, the first day, I had all the old music and I brought all that with me. And Ellis standing by the piano said, man, you know, if it hadn't been for this music, I don't think I would have finished doing it. And after he said that, you know, I thought about it, I said, yeah, this is the music that we used to study. I write tunes, we used to write tunes. Because we were trying to learn how to play, you know, this kind of music. And that's when I realized, I said, man, I should, I, this music got to be, you know, I got to put it in some kind of way that after we're gone, the music will be here. It might not be here right now, but it's going to be here for a while. And uh, no, no, the three of the cats, there's five of us, nine, but two of us left. Me and Ellis, we the only two, because Alvin's gone. And, Blackwell's gone, Richard Payne is gone. So that's what the book was for. The book was, was to leave something uh, that might have some longevity. Yeah. And I, I, the other day when I was leaving here, I heard some cat with a trumpet upstairs practicing uh, uh, swinging at the Haven. <laughs> yeah, he practiced on it. Hmm, I see somebody looked at, got that book. Wow. You know, yeah. and, and and that's what that's that's what my hope is that you know that young people will want will get interested and find it. That must have been a great feeling to hear. Oh well, yeah, just to hear somebody you know, be practicing that one or two of that book. Uh, so can you think of a few just general words of wisdom to pass along to some of the young musicians that are coming up today. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I wish I could. I wish I'd have had some passed on to me, because I'm not. I, I don't. Uh, I don't keep things in my head that make me think that they wisdom, wisdom, something like that. I just talk, and I try to talk as honest as I as I. Maybe I talk too much. That's what I'm worried about now. I'm saying stuff that I maybe shouldn't say. It. So I don't know. Um, you find some some stuff in there that you may think is wisdom. You you can figure it out. Okay. And so what's what's next for Harold Betis? What are your plans? So? <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh man. Well. I'm gonna try to get that saxophone fixed up. See that one sitting right over there? Oh, okay. That's a, that's a sax some some company gave me. It's not too. It's not. It doesn't work too well. So if I can find somebody to fix it up, right? I know somebody who does saxophone repairs. It's really good. It's oh yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, okay. I got to see him perform uh, a couple months ago, actually. The, oh yeah. Yeah. Well, piano thing at uh, One Eye Jacks Club. It used well, to be. It used to be the Toulouse Cabaret. I mean, I've heard of all those things. I don't know. I have. I don't. Yeah. Uh, go out. Okay, the only time I see Jesse is when he does snug. Snug, right? Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. We're ready to go. Yep. Okay. All right. So we're rolling. Mm -hmm. So just reaching back, uh, Mr. Betis. Well, let me start 
with mm -hmm. this. Uh, just need to make yeah. sure that we have your permission to videotape this and to use this for the Offbeat Awards uh, at the end of this month. Yeah. Okay. And uh, so reaching back in your career, what what made you decide to become a musician in the first place? Oh, yeah, yeah it's funny. I, I, I like music. When I, since I was a child, you know, and I used to pluck around on things uh, in the house to, you know, songs I like and so forth. And then I also sang at the church choir. And I just liked music, and, and but but I had a problem. My mother didn't want me to be a musician. She wanted me to be a physician. And uh, so it was always a conflict between you know, what I liked and, and what I thought I was supposed to do. Because, you know, I mean, music had a not a very good reputation, you know, uh, and it, it, it didn't have, uh, my mother, my mother uh, was, uh, was concerned about the stigma that go, went with along, particularly with popular music, and I mean, it would be all right to be a classical musician, I guess, but to be a jazz musician or a musician that dealt with popular stuff like that. She thought that that would not lead to a, 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 a successful life. And, uh, but hmm? you did become a musician. Yeah. Actually, yeah. clearly. Yeah. And then, yeah. Uh, so so how, how were you able to make that Negotiate that? that. That's right, yeah. <laughs> Uh, I'm, I, I, I made a compromise with my mother after after high school, you know, and after I really had gotten involved and knew that I really liked to play music. Uh, I told her that I, I, I'd settle for, uh, when I went to college, I, I'd be, I'd major in uh, education, music education. So that, that, that was a compromise, so that I'd be a school teacher that was a lot more dignified than being a, just a musician. So that was my compromise. I went to college as a music education person. So you get out of college and then uh, you're performing and then eventually you... Well, I wasn't you, performing you, when I got out of college. I was teaching. You were teaching when you got out of college? Yeah, oh, my, okay. my first job was a little teaching job up in Duretta, Louisiana. And I, and I had to start a band from scratch to, you know, start a little high school band and an elementary school band. They had never had a band at that school. And I was only, at that time, I finished when I was 20 years old, so I was considered pretty young. In fact, some of the seniors was <laughs> old as me <laughs> when I got that job do that. So it was, that was turned out to be very interesting for me. I really liked it. And I got to know a lot of the kids. I still got pictures of all of those kids from back then. That was in, uh, well, I forgot when that was. That was in 52, 1952, yeah, something like that, yeah. Wow. And um, so after that, you did begin to perform, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I started, you know, the first time I had a, a perform, because the fact I had performed a little bit while I was still in school, you know, a couple of guys had bands around here, and uh, I got a chance to play play with them, and they had a gig. The, my first gig, they were selling ice and wood and coal out of the backyard. You know, that was it. My dad was a tailor. Had a shop on Rambo Street, but he didn't own it, so he was just the cat who fixed people's clothes. And all of the Jews around him were selling clothes, and they sent them people to him that ought to, you know. Anyway, I didn't have any background in business, but I knew that that was the key. We needed to own something. And if anything, we ought to own music, because I said, man, we just show a booking agency. Everybody I know is, is Coming down here, like, and they take to get our music. We get forty-one dollars. They go back making forty-one million dollars. Right, that's right. And so that's why. Uh, and Melvin decided. Melvin, who lastly, who was my partner, 
he, under, he was the first cat that understood what I was trying to do. So, yeah, he, and he's the one who gave it the name. So he called it, called, called it all for one. Well, that's great. And then uh, just switching gears a little bit. So how, uh, you talked about how you met uh, Sonny Bono. Mm -hmm. But, but how, how did, what was the development of that uh, relationship? Well, that, it started then. It started when, we, when the two of us were hired to replace Blunt's Blackwell, you know, for that specialty. And so I was like the New Orleans, New Orleans base, and he, he kept he kept him out in Los Angeles, which, and I found out they were paying him more than they was paying me. I mean, naturally, because they thought he was going. To, anyway, uh, so he he and I worked together enough for him, and he'd come down here enough to get to know who I was, and he began to see think, and I didn't realize it then, but he thought I was pretty bright. You know, and, and I was educated, and I had been a school teacher. And he had dropped out of school, see, you know, so he really thought I was a genius. <laughs> I could write music, and I could do all that stuff like that. And so our relationship was one like that, where he thought I was great like that. He could, he had ability to talk to people. He, I'd hear him on the phone, man, he could smooth him to death, man. And uh, so, Years passed, uh, uh, and I, 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 I came and set up an office for, for, for specials, and I worked there. But they went out of business, because Art Root got sick of this payola, it was a thing called payola back then. Mm -hmm. And when Sonny, uh, Sonny was used to, was working for Phil Spector after that, when I went back out to Los Angeles, he worked for Phil Spector, sort of like a, go for a general something, hang around. And Cher used to, she was a groupie who liked to hang around, all of that stuff. And hanging around that, her and Sonny had a blind date or something like that, and they, they got to going together, and he found out she wanted to sing. So he, he that's, he, you know, he, he, she said she had an uncle that had some money that was going to the studio. That's what Sonny told me. <laughs> and by that time, I had gotten back in touch with Sam Cooke. Sam was a big star by then. So I was doing things for his label. He had a label on there. And, and I, I, I brought an idea of what we would call the Soul Station, where, and I was opening up a small storefront place in the black community where the people in Watts and all the South parts of Los Angeles could come and prepare their stuff to take out to Hollywood. Because most, most of the talent didn't get to Hollywood, you know, they just didn't know how to approach Hollywood and then they didn't know how to present them things. So that's what the Soul Station was designed to do. Sonny came down there after he met Cher and asked me and told me about what he wanted to try to do and he asked me what I you know, help him to cut a record. And so we did, I, I, I didn't even, the first time he wanted to do something, I, I just wrote the music for him like that and let them go to the studio. Uh, had he knew, had a studio. And uh, the foundation, for, like it was my second chance of trying to, because while I was out in Los Angeles, I also started a non-profit thing uh, it was, I called it uh, New Orleans Musicians Association. I forgot what I called it now. But the, the idea then was to, because I was getting, ever since this early, the, the mid-60s when Mac Rapper and I first came out there, uh, uh, I had been getting so many people, somebody was telling people, man, you go out to Los Angeles, man, call Harold, man, call Harold, you know, whatever like that. And there were so many people like that. I said, well, man, we need to have something, that, some way to, that we can benefit it. all of these people that's coming out here. Man, I had a whole, I did a, I did a, uh, uh, I did a, a series at, at a club out there on, on Hollywood a Boulevard it's called a Lingerie. Every Friday night I would have, uh, we'd have a, a band I had, see that band they call the New Orleans Native, that's them there back there, but that's the, that, that's the New Orleans Native. It's all mm -hmm. New Orleans cats that's in Los Angeles. 
Them two old Henry Butlers are on there, Tammy Lynn, all of them. Leo knows them. Lenny McDaniel. Lenny McDaniel, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, and every Friday we would play at this club on Sunset Boulevard. Man, we'd have people around the block lined up to midnight trying to get in. And, you know, and but so every week we'd bring out, like we brought Lee Dorsey out there one weekend. We brought uh, Benny Spellman. We brought the Nevilles. You know, just bring New Orleans people out there, man. And I saw how, you know, I mean, it, it was just verified things that I believe I read about this city, what we got here. And, uh, and, and so everywhere else, we would get the kind of thing that we wish we could get here. And a bunch of people just... <clears throat> and I, I can understand it, you know, like if you got something in your backyard, and it's been there all yeah. And somebody come along and says, see, man, you got some of that, man? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You want it? You can have that. Because yeah. you don't think it's worth nothing. But OK, give it to her. That's the way that works. And that's the way the city is. It, it, was, it had been a grab bag for all these years, for all the little labels around. Even Atlantic was like that, Atlantic Records and and. and what the, I forget. All of them, all of them, they'd come down here, boom, 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 go on. Right, right. And so the challenge for people who are from New Orleans seems to be to recognize that where those treasures are. Yeah, and, and recognize, I mean, it's, it's a, it, sometimes I think I go maybe too deep with it, but we got a history that makes too many people here believe that the black community is, has no nothing good. They all they hear about is the murders and the rapes and all that. Whatever they hear about, so they, their their image is skewed. They don't understand the brilliance that's in the black community. And we we're hoping. I'm hoping that this man who's going to be our president now, they may begin to think that. There is something good there, something, there's something other than that we don't have to be afraid. They ain't going to do us like we did them. And that's what I'm thinking. They've been, the general overall feeling is that we, look what we did to these people. And often I've said myself, I said, man, you give me about 10 white folks to work for me for 20 years for nothing, then I probably would be rich too. Because we worked for 200 and some odd years for nothing. Just for food, that's all. We work like the car cows and the horses. Well, I didn't go too far. <laughs> okay. All right. Are you feeling all this stuff, man? Well, I got to see this before y'all give it away. <laughs> I got to see what y'all going to cut out or not. <laughs> well, uh, we will have a viewing at some point uh, all right. next week. Things are going to kind of go pretty quick after all this. Right. But, uh... So people just took it for granted. It's just for the fun, that's all. It's just for having fun. That's why my mother probably didn't want me to be a musician. Because she said, hey, it's all right, let's have something that's fun, but what you going to do? What you, how you going to make a living? And uh, I, I, unfortunately, that, that heritage, that history of music, it's like old Sammy, like Jesus said, what could, could, could come out of Nazareth? Because it's such a you know uh, place, it can't be too much. It's coming right out of Nazareth. Well, that's the kind of mentality we had. You know, you, you can't get nothing out to get over them cats ain't doing nothing out there. But that's that was, is what I learned personally that there were so many treasures in the black community that the black people didn't realize because they had been made to be domesticated animals or whatever, and we just know how to work. My mother didn't want me to go in business. She wanted me to get a job. You understand? Mm -hmm. And I guess a lot of people were like that, but that was just prevalent in the black community where a job, having a good job was a lot safer than talking about going into business. So, you know. So that's what AFO was about. That's you know that's what most of that. My feeble attempt 
not knowing how much more you got to know. And even after I came back to New Orleans, you know, and I knew a lot more than I still didn't know anything, you know, uh, about what I've learned since I've been back here. And I've seen a new political situation. I'm seeing all of the stuff that goes now. Uh, and, and so now I'm, I'm, you know, I realize how deep this history goes back. And how, you know, although it looks a lot better now, it's, it's still essence seems the same way to me. So we got a lot of work to do. And, and so uh, just continuing on that thing, why? You had some success in Los Angeles, mm -hmm. and uh, why did you return to New Orleans? You came back and you took a position at the University of New Orleans. Oh, that was called man out there and asked me when it, when 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 Greg, what's his name? O'Brien, O'Brien, mm -hmm. when he became chancellor out there, uh, he saw that. First of all, I think it was a combination of things. People perceive you in as being a white school. Sooner was a black school at that point. And I think Greg saw that he got, we got we to gotta change that image. They didn't have many black students out there. So he figured if you can, if he, Ellis had just left New Orleans because they wasn't, he wasn't getting the kind of support he needed up at Noco. And his wife said, man, you got to get you somewhere where you can get you some money. So that's why he left. But Greg said, if we can get him to come back, to start a jazz program, then that might change the image of the school. So when he called him in Virginia about that, Ellis called me and you know, asked me what I come back for a position and things, you know. So that's 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 the reason why I came. Uh, that he invited me back and and I had I had already started doing some teaching out in Los Angeles. I had you know, well lectures. I would go to UCLA and go to various campuses and, and talk at the invitation of somebody out, some professor who wanted me to come talk about it. So I enjoyed. I was beginning to re enjoy the idea of teaching uh, and being in touch with some of the young young people who were aspiring to get into this thing. And uh, so uh, then AFO becomes a foundation after you come back. Yeah. You start the foundation. And what, what's the well, mission? Of well, that? the yeah. mission, the, the I actually got money was over at a place called the Pentagon. You ever heard of the Pentagon? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was a club on uh, Galvis and uh, St. Bernard back in, in the late 40s or early 50s. And uh, 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 a guy named Joe Jones had a big band. So uh, he had me, I, I got to rehearse with the band. And uh, then when they had a gig at the Pentagon, I got to play third alto in the band. And uh, boy, it was a real thrill just to be able to play. Right. And, and the funny thing was after the gig, he gave me six dollars, and, and I didn't know why he gave. It. I said, "Well, why'd you give me this money?" <laughs> that's your money. That's your salary. Man, I didn't know you could get paid to do this, man. I was just having fun up there. But he had paid all the other cats too. Well. <laughs> <laughs> right. right. You hear those stories a lot, too. Yeah. Uh, so, talk about some of the original reasons behind the founding of AFO. AFO on the record label. Yeah, that yeah that uh, that came along uh, after uh, after I had uh, been teaching for about four years, and I had I, I had given that up because uh, I mean the, uh, what the reason I gave was, and that's what what what's interesting was that uh, I had trouble with the, the systems. Uh, with segregation and all that stuff that was going on at that time. And uh, I, my first job in Derrida, they, I went to a meeting with my principal and the school board of people talked to him such such a way that I was embarrassed. 
you know, and they, you know, they, they talked to him like he was, and he was holding his head up. So that didn't work out. Then I had the same problem when I came back here to New Orleans, uh, and I was teaching, and the, the, the music supervisor uh, had the audacity to come to my class one day and told me I was spending too much time teaching him how to read. The parents just wanted him to play some songs, you know, and uh, they didn't need to do that. And, and I was at that point, I was sort of militant, because I, I knew that uh, over at Jesuit, which was a white school then, and various white, I, I asked him, I said, well, do you, do you tell the people over there not to teach the children how to read? Why don't you want me to, you know, I, I confronted him about that. And I had to go to, down to the school board and, you know, have a deal, dealing with the, all of them. And they offered me, a, a, you know, a choice of whether I could comply with what the, what the supervisor wanted or I could resign. So that settled it for me, I resigned. That was it. So I was in my school. I thought that would be the end of my. In AFO, uh, after I, I left New Orleans, and uh, I, myself along with uh, Ellis Marcellus and a cat named Edward Blackwell, they were planning to go out to California, and I had just quit my job, and I had already got married. So I was. You know, I was the only one of the three who had some responsibility, but I said, hey, I got a call. And uh, Arnett Coleman had sent Blackwell a ticket to come out to California. I don't know if you know who Arnett Coleman is. Arnett? Oh, yeah, for sure. Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah. And because uh, he had been here in New Orleans for a couple of days, stranded in New Orleans or something like that. Right. And, and uh, he got to know a few cats here, and he... Him and he had run into Blackwell, and he just loved Blackwell. And so he sent for Blackwell, and, I, and uh, so I'm out of a job, and I'm married. I'm, so I said, "Well, look, you can cash that chicken and that ticket, and, and and I can take my car out there, and the three of us go." That's how I got out to California. I don't know if you had a question about how did I, because you didn't know.